Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dress Thorson Presents Fun with Flags. <laughs> um, my name is Lord Dr Dress Thorson, and um, hot banners have been a hobby of mine. Uh, I've been in the SCA for about 10 years, uh, and they uh, and, and banners have been just like my hobby within a hobby, as well as fighting and lots of other things. But uh, um, one of the things that uh, I saw was was missing was the ability to make banners quickly so you can so we could dress up an area for campsite or, or for indoors uh, you know uh, in a reasonable amount of time uh, I found that you know, a, a lot of people would have whole days or whole weekends spent just to make a couple banners in their garage and and so I started researching methods and um, ways to, to get it done more quickly and still come out with a a quality banner. Um, so this class is is just a, a brief history of banners. So we can, so if you're not as excited about banners as I am right now, maybe maybe they will. Um, uh, you will be after this. Um, so let me go ahead and and start with uh, you know running all the way back to the beginning of of um, flag history or or banner history that is. Um, the, the, as far as back as we know. Um, the uh, the emblem of showing your authority uh, goes back to 3000 BC with the uh, vexiloid. Uh, both the uh, Babylonians and the Romans uh, had vexiloids, which weren't necessarily cloth. So so it's kind of a stretch to call it a a, a flag or a banner. But uh, that's that's the the beginning of of the show of authority or who am I on the field? Uh, it, it was the uh, Roman and Babylonian vexiloids. So you see the little picture there. And then moving on up to where we get to cloth and, and start actually having the, the flags waving in the air, the, uh, the fifth century uh, Greek Navy started having uh, flags on their vessels. And that's the, as far as uh, I've researched, that's the first known uh, cloth flag or, or banner um, that we know of in history. Um, speaking of flag versus banner, uh, that's an, that's, that comes up a lot. And basically um, every banner is a flag but not every flag is a banner. And basically the difference is that uh, a banner is generally gonna have um, a heraldic display on it, where, whereas a flag you know, can be used for multiple purposes. And moving on up through history, there's multiple cultures that had banners and flags um, going up through all of the SCA periods. Uh, Byzantium had a, a labarium, which is basically the, the uh, banner hanging from a string and, and hanging straight down on a pole, uh, and Mongols. And as well, there was some documentation of a Norse flag that was captured and uh, looks something like this $5 flag from a uh, from uh, Amazon, you can see here, <laughs> and there's a little drawing of it in some rocks as well. That they, that's why they came up with this uh, shape, uh, because of, of that one uh, carving that had that in it. And then moving on up into the Crusades in the, the from 1095 to 1099, uh, there were there was documentation and examples of the the fighters fighting under the banner of Pope Urban II. And then moving into the 11th, 12th, and 13th century is when um, flags actually started to become, uh, and the, the heraldic displays on the banners actually became a thing and started developing, and there became more rules about uh, how to display your heraldry on banners and things like that. And here's, you can see that all the, uh, the, um, our, uh, <laughs> Parts of the banner um, define here. Um, so if you're if you're talking to a, a heraldic person or or a flag person, uh, yeah, this is you know you, this terminology would be used to dis to distinguish like the uh, the different parts. Um, looking at this, the most important thing from a heraldic point of view is the fact that the the uh, staff is on the left side. So whenever you're uh, discussing something heraldic. Um, you're going to be thinking about that the heraldic charge like a lion um, and which way it's facing it's going to be in regard to the staff on the left side so you know if it's facing the left side it's regarding the left side you know that type of thing so that's that's something good to keep in mind when you're when you're uh, doing a banner for somebody and you're trying to do their um their device um you want to keep in mind that it's that of course 
with the, as you'll see when my process is here, the uh, banner will, the silk banner will come out with the, uh, the charge on it, the opposite on the other side. So of course that can't be helped. Yet. <laughs> uh, here's a, just a couple of different banner types and the names that they've had through history. Um, one, one of them that's interesting here, you see the tapered pin and down on the left there, a lot of people will see uh, what, what is actually a streamer uh, and is a standard and they'll call it a pin um, but the uh, pin has actually uh, different um, ratio dimensions. We'll see in the next slide here. See, uh, a lot of people call that standard streamer up in the top right hand corner a pin but when it's actually flown uh, horizontally and, and with a different dimension um, or ratio of length versus width, it's actually a standard, but it's a streamer standard. And you see a couple other different uh, variations of standards. Um, and keep in, keep in mind these shapes later on when I show you my techniques for, for actually doing these and dyeing them and stretching them out on, on the, um, on the uh, uh, frame, uh, you can see that there'll be a little different techniques and things you, ha you have to kind of figure out and be creative with yourself to be able to get the fabric to stretch right um, if you're doing the shape. Um, if you, if you're, if you sew your shape first. Um, so I know a lot of people will actually uh, die on a full piece of silk and then, um, then move to their shape. So it's, you know, personal preference there. Um, so now uh, that, that was the brief history of banners. I've moved really quickly through all, all of history here. So I can go ahead and get to uh, sharing some of my processes. Um, there are lots of ways to do banners. There's a lot more historically accurate ways to do banners. Um, this is just a way to, to be able to get something that's going to be pretty and, and up on uh, up on your your staff and hoist above your tent and and look good and show who you are. Um, and it also, if you're interested in doing banner classes, if you follow this process, you can get people through the process, you know, from like 10 o'clock to, to noon, um, getting part of the work done, having it dry. And then uh, after that, two more hours of, of dying. And they're able to take home a pretty good sized banner home with them for just a day class, which is great. Um, the 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 um, the methods that I'm talking about here are not period by any means. Um, there's the materials, silk, you know, were were period of course, you know, that came to Italy during you know late period SCA period, um, and the the taking a a, a, a substance like wax and using that to keep dye from going into an area on cloth um, was that we think was around the second century in India. Um, so it is period, but uh, the type of resist that we're using, um, um, you know, aren't, aren't, isn't the wax that was used in period. Um, so anyway, let me start with the process here. So when I do a class, what I do is I, is I get people to send me their device uh, along with the uh, description of their device, um, their blazon. Um, and then I, work, I, I go into a program called GIMP, which I'll, I'll tell you about a little bit later. Uh, this is a free drawing program. And then I try to draw, I sketch out and, and download some pictures of their, or, or cut and paste from the device picture that they sent me. And I try to get that prepped before the day of, before the day of class. So, so when I say it's a four hours to, to make the uh, banner, we're talking about just the class time. Of course, I, I do a lot of prep work to have things ready for the people in the class. So if you're actually talking about start to finish and you're just doing your own banner, um, I would say maybe, you know, maybe six or seven hours of, of prep work and, and stuff like that, building your frame. Um, so what, what I do when I, when I uh, draw the, I'll, I'll print out multiple sizes of someone's charge. Like here's a guy that, that had a, a coiled up snake as his charge. And so I, I printed out with multiple different sizes here. Um, so when it came to the day of class and he could actually look at it himself and, and see, you know, does he want, does he want to put his charge on there three times? Well, then we can use the smaller one. And so that allows us to not have to bring a printer to the classroom and uh, we can kind of uh, adjust things on the fly without, uh, without too much equipment there. Um, the, the, so the next thing is a day of class. Basically, um, the, to, save, to save even more time, what I do is go ahead and I pin the silk to the frame ahead of time. Uh, yeah, here's the information about GIMP.org. It's in the, you can just click on that link here if you, if you download this, uh, this presentation here. Um, 
also with, with searching for images um, for someone's helping them put together the, the charge on their device on the banner. Um, I, I just search for things with Google's image search, but a good way to get a good traceable image is to uh, filter your search using the tools um, uh, feature and then choose clip art. Um, that will get you something that's, that's already easy to trace. Otherwise, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, especially with rare charges that are something unique that, that's, that aren't the, that many pictures of, I'll take the, the picture and then put it into a free um, drawing tool and try to, you know, use different um, features in the, in the drawing program to make it more traceable. Um, when I, I was talking earlier about pinning to the to the frame, this is something I found when I was researching how to do banners myself. I looked at lots of different YouTube videos and compiled like the methods that I thought would be most quick and fastest and most efficient to be able to do for a class. Um, I know there are lots of methods. Some people will, will actually pin the whole silk to a, a wooden frame. Um, some people will stitch a single thread through the edges of the of the silk all the way around and wrap it around their frame, which looks really cool and and it keeps your dye from from getting um, on you know anything else and having clips in the way. Other people will use like just the paper clips that you know big binder clips. Um, but you of course as you're dyeing it, you you have to take those binder clips and take them off so your dye will flow correctly. And you can see here in this um, this little picture that's that's a basically a rust proof needle you know they're they're meant for um uh, it's great to use the rust proof because they're going to be getting wet all the time and you don't want a box full of rusty pins <laughs> um and then what you see there that it's pinned to is painter's tape um you know it's, it's not environmentally friendly because you're going to throw that away every time but what it allows you to do is uh, adjust your your uh, tension uh, ongoing as you're doing the process uh, really easily you just pull the tape up off your PVC there and uh, pull it back just a little bit if you need it as as the dye sets in it'll it'll soak and, and cause your dye your uh, silk to start sagging um, so that's why I use that method and then here's a whole laundry list of, of things that have come up in in banner classes in the past that, that people had problems with. And uh, I just wanted to outline a few of these real quick. There's something to keep in mind yourself, but um, but more importantly, when if you're doing a class of five to 10 people, um, you wanna make sure that you've kind of uh, told people this before they start uh, some of these things like, like uh, when you're you know, working with people in a class, you wanna make sure that their charges are like b big and bold and like easy to draw. Otherwise they, they may run into a time constraint there if they're trying to, you know, do, do minute details on something. Um, so um, another thing is, you know, if you've ever um, painted a, a room or a, a ceiling or a floor, you know, you don't you don't start at the doorway and work your way in. Uh, you, you start in the corner, of course, and work your way towards the door. Um, and I've had a couple of people where, I've, I, luckily, I bring extra silk because um, they've accidentally put their arm or their hand like in in the gouda as they're drawing it on there. Um, another thing is is the they wanted with the Gouda, which I'll show you in more in a minute here, and I'll do a demonstration. Um, you want to draw the finest possible line with the Gouda so that it has time to dry during your class you know, uh, time. Uh, some people, if they, if they goop it on there, then you're waiting all the way up until the very end of your class to, to be able to dye because the Gouda hasn't dried yet. Um, but also, you know, on the other hand, you don't want to leave any gaps in that gouda or or your dye will, will bleed out and, and cause a problem. Um, one of the other things that, that people talk about all the time with, with uh, dyeing silk is when you're doing large sections um, up against the charge of an you know or a different section of color, um, you've got to move really quickly because as the dye is drying um, and then you accidentally brush over that, then you've basically doubled up your dye in that area. So there'll be all these cool looking watercolor um, blurs in your in your silk and if you want that that's cool but if you want a, a solid color um, then you've got to work really fast as you move because you don't want to um, get those those blurred um, multi, you know darker and lighter sections as you go um, one other thing that, that's come up many times in the past is um, you know you don't have to have the highest quality paint brushes for your class uh, or to do, to do silk dyeing. But what you do want to do is make sure if any of your paint brushes have um, any hairs 
that are kind of sticking off to the side, make sure to get those clipped off before anybody starts painting because even the little, most minute little drop of water on that little hair, um, when, it, when it flings, it, it, when it lands on your, your white silk, um, it'll, it'll spread in, in like a cross pattern and there's nothing that's gonna get that out really, especially not in the time of a class or, or you know, that you're able to do. So sometimes you just have to kind of like paint over that with, with white and especially just avoid that and, and be careful. Um, uh, another and one one other thing, um, all, all of this I do on a big piece of cardboard. So when I'm having a class coming up, I'll, I'll look around for, for people throwing out refrigerator boxes or, or uh, big Amazon boxes and stuff like that and, and piece them together and, and have them all ready so I can you know, put them on the tables for, for classes um, so I don't have to keep boxes around my house year round. <laughs> Um, so on, on this presentation, I've got a whole list of materials uh, that I use uh, on an Amazon uh, shopping list uh, that's public. And so you can just click on that link and everything I use and everything I'll show you in a, in a few minutes here uh, um, is on that list other than the actual PVC pipe itself that I would definitely recommend going to a uh, hardware store for um, because um, if, if you look at, there is PVC on Amazon, but it's very expensive per foot and shipping and all that stuff's crazy. So um, then here's some of the references for some of the history stuff that I talked about earlier in this presentation. And then now I'll go ahead and move on to showing you guys some stuff um, uh, with the process here. Let me see if I can move my camera over here. All right. So what you see here is, is the frame you saw in that picture earlier with, um, it's a 15 inch by 60 inch um, piece of silk there. And that's, you'll see that in my Amazon shopping list there. It's this product here, let me get some light on it here. Um, um, it's, it's about 11 bucks each for each one. And what's great about that is the fact that it's uh, already uh, a hand rolled stitch all the way around it. So you don't have to serge it or, or hand stitch. Uh, on my first banner, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have a serger. So I hand rolled stitched. So I, I looked up YouTube videos on how to hand roll stitch and, and it took uh, days to do so. Um, I definitely, um, after doing that one, I. I uh, got a serger and learned how to do it that way. <laughs> so definitely for efficiency and for, for a banner class, I would, I would definitely suggest buying the uh, Haboti, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, um, scarves that are already uh, got the, the hand rolled stitch in this, in, on the side. Um, for making your frame, um, these, you, you can cut the PVC with any um, basic tool like a, uh, you know, like a, a hacksaw or whatever, but that's real messy. And if you're going to be doing a lot of different frames of different sizes, uh, I really recommend this. It's like 13 bucks and it's a little um, clipper that ratchets and, uh, and, it, and it just cuts right, right through the PVC and that makes, makes it a lot cleaner because it, it just slices it rather than creating a bunch of PVC dust. Um, the uh, the painter's tape that I use is just any kind of painter's tape and I just double over the edge and then and then pin it, pin the silk right underneath it. I'll show a little example of that, see if I can do it, holding it up vertically here. So basically you're, let's see. Here's a rough, version of that is, to, see, let me hold it right up here. There we go. That way your, your uh, dye can flow right up to the very edge of your, of your um, silk and, uh, and you can readjust the tape throughout the process. If you're doing a banner class, I highly recommend getting a lot of cheap pencil sharpeners. And the, the reason for that is uh, one of the, the things we use to trace the charges on the silk is um, uh, I, I use a fabric uh, pencil and I find that um, 
people want to be able to see their lines, so they'll press pretty hard. And so um, this was a, you know, a, a full-size pencil when I, I, before one of my classes. And so you can see this one person ate up this much of the, the pencil doing, doing just a 60-inch banner there. So I would definitely recommend um, getting a couple pencil sharpeners so everyone's not having to share the same one <laughs> if you want to get it done fast. Hey, Jeff, sorry to interrupt. If you want to stop your screen share, we'll be able to see uh, your video much larger. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good idea. There we go. All right, so now you can see my table full of stuff. So what I've got here is um, a little a demonstration of Gouda. I'll, I'll bring these over closer to you so you can see. Uh, So there's there's mul multiple choices, and for a classroom, when you want to get um, people done and uh, and uh, with their banner fast, I use this type of Gouda, which is in my Amazon list. There, um, it comes pre-made in multiple colors. You know, not as many. You know, not every color in the rainbow, but black and white and silver and things like that. Um, so I generally just get black and white. And if someone has like I usually try to figure out how to have a black outline on things if I'm doing a class for people because mixing Gouda can actually burn up a lot of time and getting the right colors. Um, but that's the next thing I was going to show is mixing Gouda. If you are going to do that, then another thing on my shopping list are these little mixer bottles that have a really fine point for drawing. Um, but of course, then you need a, these little funnels, which are on my wish list as well, or shopping list. Um, and then you have your your, your base Gouda, which is gonna be a resist that'll stop the dye from flowing. Um, and then you use the base Gouda mixed with whatever color of dye, and then that will get you a color Gouda uh, so that you don't have a black or white outline on what you're, what you're drawing. That's, that takes a little more time, um, is a little more problematic. So if you can plan ahead, and make it where you can outline things with black or white. That helps for a four hour class. Another thing you can do, this is one thing I've, I've done from scrap. I had a bunch, I did a bunch of large streamers. And so I had a bunch of triangular long pieces of scrap here as you can see and so i just surged the edges of this scrap here and basically um you know of course if, if you're here in florida then you know this the trimeris triskel there um and an easy way instead of actually having to put all this silk and, and mount it up on a frame you can actually get embroidery frames um and that'll allow you to do uh, just a single charge and you can see here I've got the got a little cardboard behind it here. And so you can trace that that out. <clears throat> I'll bring you over here and and demo that here. If I can lean the camera up a little bit more here. Also, one of my references earlier that I used was Tournaments Illuminated, of course, an SCA publication number 148. See there, um, this has a good article on heraldry and banners. Uh, with with a lot of history and types and and information like that so that's a good one to have looking for my pencil here so basically in your class this is going to be your first step for your your folks they're, they're going to stretch their their silk out on the frame whether it be the large frame or or this little frame here and you're going to set it over your item to trace. Let's see if I can 
There we go. You can kind of see it here. You're not going to be able to see what I'm tracing under here, but I'm just tracing it through the silk here. So I'm just tracing a little triskel, and then I'm pressing it down all the way down. And, and now let's see if you can, well, you can, maybe you can see a little bit of triskel there. It's really light. That's why people press so hard um, so they can get that. And then the next step is to outline that with Gouda. Let's see if I've got some white Gouda here. Since, since this design will be a, a just blue and a white, um, then um, I can use a white Gouda to go ahead and um, outline it and then it'll be blue and white. I, I could use black outline here, um, but then of course, It'll, it'll kind of have a black outline to it and look kind of cartoonish, which is fine if that's what you want. Well, for the demo here, I'll just do it with black because uh, I think I burned up all my white with uh, a project I did for Gulf Wars. <laughs> So, so basically I'm just gonna go ahead and do my outline with, actually a good thing to do is always check your, the flow from your thing and make sure there's not like a dry part in there before you start, start um, drawing it on there. Yeah, it's coming out pretty goopy right now. Let's see. Whoop. Yeah, so I'll try to do a, as fine a line as I could possibly do here without any gaps. This is actually, I'm putting it on pretty thick here, but um, there are a lot of things that I've read about on Stainer's silk display on um, Facebook. It's a good, great um, silk banner um, Facebook page. And I've read that there's these other alternatives to this type of Gouda that maybe last longer and give you a lot finer um, line, but I have not tried those yet. So here's my <laughs> clumsy uh, drawing with Gouda there on the, on the silk. So the next thing you would do um, in your class, you would typically just wait for that to dry. Um, just for demonstration purposes here, I think that'll, that the resist will still do its purpose. I'll just have to be careful not to get my paintbrush touching the Gouda. I'll just let it flow. So get some blue dye out here, which is going to be careful with. Normally, I wouldn't wear a nice garb while I'm doing this, but I'll just be careful. So basically, it's just like kind of like watercolor. You just put it on and, it, and let the uh, dye flow up to the edges. You don't want to, especially since I, since my gouda is wet right now, I don't want to actually run it up to the edge. And uh, I'm doing it kind of slow just to, to show the process and kind of show it bleeding right now. But typically, you, you could do this a lot more quickly, of course. And um, with different shades, you can, if you go quickly and, and do like a really light, um, uh, putting it on only like one layer, you got, you'll have a lighter blue. And if you put it on heavily or a second coat, you'll get a much darker blue, just like you would with any other kind of paint job. So. Almost done here. Oh, I think I'm, I got into some of the wet gouda. I think I see a little black spot there. But, uh, clean off my brush, almost done here. I haven't uh, tried using it with wet gouda before, but it's like it's for demonstration purposes, I think it's gonna work. There we go. I think it's gonna flow right into that last little corner of the triskel there, and I'll put a cap on this die to, as to, so as not to get it all over myself. And I'll try to hold this up. There we go. Nice little dyed triskel there. And once you take the frame off after it dries, um, the next part of the process is to um, either iron the um, iron the silk with like a a paper towel uh, between your iron 
and the um, and your dyed material because you don't want to get gouda on your iron and then spread that all over everything. Um, or I, I usually do both, but the other alternative is just to throw it in your dryer for, for about 20 minutes on medium heat. Um, and that will lock in your dye because if you just leave it and you, and you put it up and it rains, your dye is going to still just run everywhere. So you, you need to really heat treat it to, to lock that in. Um, see. With, with purchasing on Amazon, you can get these individual big old um, bottles and they're you know a little more expensive and, and they last a really long time but what I suggest is if, if you're in the SCA and you have um, a, you know kingdom color so you think you'll be making things for your kingdom and people will be making uh, banners related to your kingdom I suggest getting the colors of your kingdom <laughs> like um, you know in my case you know, in, in Trimeris blue and white and so I go through a lot of blue and white so I get the bigger containers of blue and white um, the alternative is you can buy these little multi-packs of these little ones and they have a lot of non heraldic colors in those packages so sometimes you're wasting money on on uh, getting those um uh, all those non heraldic colors no one ever wants to use also there's at, at everyone's station when you're doing a when you're doing a class i would suggest giving them a little a little board to uh you know, check that wipe their brushes on and, and check the things. Of course, I guess anybody that's done any kind of like crafts with kids, of course, would uh, have that suggestion as well. Uh, then to finish up your banner, um, usually if everything goes well in your class and everyone's finished their um, their banner in uh, in the in a timely fashion, the next thing you do is go ahead and reinforce it. Um, I've seen lots of people do this, do this different ways. Some people will simply um, so um, ties directly to the silk. Um, when I started the SCA, I, I was told everything's got to be super tough for SCA because you don't want to be rebuilding everything every time you go to a war. Um, so what I do for reinforcement is I, and it's it, something similar to this is on my Amazon uh, shopping list that you, you can, that's linked there. Um, what I do is I take this material and I fold it over the banner and then I use embroidery thread to sew through. I double over the, the silk and then wrap this around it. And then I use embroidery thread to, to sew through this. And then at the ends, let's see if I can just, I'll fold the end over. Let's see, the end over like that. And then fold that over again. So the corners where I'm going to put my ties actually have four layers of this thick material and then the doubled over silk. So I've had, I have it a couple banners that have lasted for many years and, and the uh, tips of the banners are, are starting to go before the, the, before the reinforcement there. I can show you an example here. Here's one of the first banners I ever did. <laughs> and, uh, you can see the ties are getting a little worn, but basically that's it. I just use the same embroidery thread to, to tie on the ties and then double over that that uh, jute or you can just use, use cotton if you want to try to add something more period to your to your silk banner you can use uh, a jute um, trim for that here's an example of of so, some design variations you can do like uh, this is my my wife's device here and uh, her device is just the uh, purple with the with the white um, but uh, adding the the uh, the trim on here with the with the little checky with black and white, like really dressed it up a little bit there. Another thing I, I've done in the past, uh, since I didn't want, this is this was a pre-hemmed uh, piece of silk, but I wanted to get the the, uh, the uh, swallow tails. Let's see if I can show you the swallow tail there at the end of it. So I cut the silk and at the time I didn't have a serger and, and I didn't, uh, want to hand roll uh, stitch it. So what I did was I used the uh, sewing tape that you can iron. So you, I just rolled over the edge. I, I, I cut a piece of sewing tape in half um, and ironed that over the edge. And that's held up for, for many years now. So um, that you can see it's getting a little little uh, worse for the wear on the tip there, but it lasts pretty well. That's one little quick way if you don't feel like stitching up a part of your, your uh, bin in there. Um, Another thing to get for your class is 
a lot of these are 50 cents, I believe, at Home Depot, uh, a lot of yardsticks. And then for any straight lines, like I was just showing you on that banner, um, yardsticks are great for, for just drawing long straight lines. Or if you're going to put something on a frame um, with the full piece of silk and then cut it out later, of course, then you can draw the, the shape of your what your banner is going to end up being like. So I've gone over most of my, my stuff. Has, has anybody got any questions for me here? I see there's some things in chat. Let me see if any of those are questions for me here. Yeah, we had a question about how much the dye changes the texture of the silk. And uh, not much at all. Um, it, it actually leaves it pre-glowing. Um, oh, also, yeah, on, as, a, as a kind of a technical and historical aspect of, of silk banners, um, my best guess as to why we use silk banners in the SCA, since I, I don't know myself, I mean, I'm not a laurel or historian myself, but um, I'm not aware of any documentation so far reading other people's materials and other SEA banner classes of any actual silk banners being used in period, but the they were um, fabric with embroidery, so you ended up with the same effect of the uh, mirror image on the opposite side of your banner as you do with silk. So you end up with a really similar um, concept and for with a lot less process of embroidery. Um, and you don't have to have a 40 mile an hour wind to get it to, to flap in the breeze, which is awesome too, if you're in a place that, that's not blowing wind all the time. Uh, but yeah, you. You can, like with, with the dye, it's still really light and, and flowy and, um, once it's like if right when you're done it's going to be stiff as a board from the gouda um and and from the dry dye but once once you've uh heat treated it and um it, once it's I, I i'm always afraid to actually hand wash it myself um the first time so i always just bring it to an event and once it gets rained on for the first time then that proves that my that i heat treated it enough <laughs> um let's see what else is there the weight of the edging Affect how it flies. Um, well, with the with the hand rolled stitch that, that you can get pre pre done, that's about the lightest weight edge you can get. Um, that's that's you know it doesn't affect it at all. The um, oh, let me see my other one here that is I just did. Um, when you surge the edge, it does make it a little thicker, but it's still nice and light and flowy. But you can see here. I, I surged the blue edge on these because they're all going to be trimeris banners at some point. Um, and that does make it a little stiffer, but it's still, you can still see it's going to blow in the wind and not, not stiffen it up much. Um, also, like you can see, uh, I uh, surged the edge of this one and I surged it uh, with blue. I didn't feel like changing the thread. Um, and then I dyed it black and the black dyed right over the, the blue so it didn't uh, cause any problem there. So that saved me from changing out my thread in my serger, which I hate doing. <laughs> oh yeah, Victoria, yeah, the, the, uh, I got the idea for the, the uh, embroidery hoops because I wanted to make a, a whole bunch of these um, banners for my household uh, for for the last Gulf Wars, it didn't happen, um, and that made it made the process go a lot faster. But of course, um, since since it wasn't a white background, I did the um, the charge with the hoop, and then I still had to go back and put it on the frame to do the uh, the black dye. But yeah, it did save a lot of time. Cool. Yeah. Well, I hope. Yeah, I hope the information I gave today was good. Um, if you go, if you forget a lot of things I said today, or I was talking really fast, um, the um, if you go to see that Amazon shopping list that's in my presentation that you can download from our site there, um, you'll you'll remember like all the things I was talking about with the 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 funnel and the the Gouda and and all the all the different things. Um, so uh, that that'll probably remind you. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, quick question. Um, how often do you do things like 
uh, for gift baskets or largesse or stuff like that, how often do you find like you get tapped for that kind of stuff? Because um, the work's beautiful, well, so. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, pr pretty often, um, uh, like, <laughs> again, like uh, the, this is actually done from scrap from another project. I got hit up to do some, some kingdom banners and I ended up making 13 of them. Um, and they were all like seven foot long and two feet wide um, for golf wars, but of course that didn't happen. So I'm, look, I'm looking forward to seeing those up sometime. So yes, uh, people do um, hit me up um, a lot. Um, I actually have a thing where we're in a small shire. And so when we get somebody new um, and, they, and they get their device passed here, it's my personal thing that I'll, I'll go out of my way and I'll have them over to my house and, and we'll get their banner, a banner done for their device as a, as a thank you for sticking with it and getting their device passed and everything. That's awesome, thank you very much. Thank you, that was a great class. I just wanna remind everybody to head back to the center of the longhouse and hang out and we're gonna have a talk fireside chat we're gonna zoom trivia and have prizes and it's gonna be great so we'll cool. see you all I'll there. look forward to seeing that myself <laughs> thanks for joining everybody thank you very much for teaching Hey, uh, Cynthia, are you, are you there? Yes, hi. It's hey, uh, it's, it's good to, uh, I saw you there, so I was like, oh, my chance to say hello. Uh, I, yeah. I've uh, been looking at Stainer Silk Display for a long time now, so thanks for having that uh, having that page. Yeah, and this uh, this is great, just showing people the process. It'll, you know, gives them, takes the mystery out of, of it all. It was really great. I like, and, and that you could do it in four hours. I always have these eight hour classes. And then I decided just to do workshops now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, with, with the, uh, the 15 by 60 is about the largest you can get that's pre hemmed. Um, from right. from the you know the Hobodies car, so I'm sure you know that. <laughs> um, yeah. And my, my personally, I, I I've had better luck with shipping from like of Dharma stuff from Amazon than from Dharma themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, this this is really great. Now, where 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 are you mundanely in in Florida? Uh, I'm I'm on the Space Coast in Florida, uh, on the East Coast, uh, just a little bit south of where the shuttle used to take off and SpaceX is oh. now and that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, I've been down there. I was to uh, let's see, the Shire of South Keep, Miami. Oh, cool! And I did a workshop there about three years ago for everybody. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're, they're yeah. just south of us. I go down to their fighter practice every once in a while. Yeah, so that's that's neat. I I just think this is great. I I'm glad you posted it. I wouldn't have known about it, and um, and uh, you really I'm no inspired people, and and uh, your information was really good. Now I hope. Um, is this something we could put up in files, your downloaded material? Oh, sure, in a, definitely. In a group? Yeah, that would be wonderful. That way um, I can point people, we can point people to that information. And cool. this was great. So um, nice to meet you too. I, yeah. You know, and um, we're going to have a, we have an announcement posted. We're going to have a, a little visit. Uh, I can't remember the date, July 24th or 26th it's posted in our group and and we're going to have a little it's just uh like talking about what we're doing or answer any questions so um we're going to do that with the zoom for this cool. month we did we did it last month and you know it's just like us talking now it was so yeah. nice to meet some people in the group you know yeah, um, definitely 
I try to meet people at larger events, have a meet and greet, but usually one or two show up, which is nice. It's really helped, but it really puts a face to everything. And, and um, so I'm really glad you did what you did and, and made that effort. And I, I look forward to getting to visit with you once in a while. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Okay. Great job. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, yeah. Remember to post that up in files for us. Yeah. The, yeah. The video of this, I think I'll be able to retrieve as well uh, with, with our uh, autocrat uh, soon and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get it up there as well. Yeah. I, I saw on my, I, I'm, I've only been to a couple Zoom things, so it's, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I saw it said it was recording while yep. I was watching you. So that, I, it's, it's just, just great. I think it's just it's really the only benefit of this pandemic thing is the Zoom thing has opened it up to so many people that can't get to an event to see take a certain class. Now, you know, this is really opened up to people. And um, like I had this one friend in Amarillo, Texas. She's a million miles from everything and she just can't get to events and she is teaching like crazy and talking with people. And, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's sad we have what's going on, but I think this zoom thing is uh, here to stay. <laughs> yeah. So by the time we're able to meet in person, everybody will be inspired and have a lot more knowledge. <laughs> right. Right. And then this connection has been a, you know, without it, we wouldn't have all this connection. You've really made my day. I'm just sitting here smiling. <laughs>